Our talk today is about sourcing and refining of critical minerals uh, in Latin America. So some of these critical minerals, what are they? They're rare earth elements. And what are rare earth elements? They are the eums at the bottom of the periodic table that you studied in chemistry class 20, 30 plus years ago. They have long names and they're very, uh, not very well known. However, they have huge strategic importance. And uh, we at Oxico would argue that this is the new oil, this is the new fuel for the, the new economy. A lot of these rare earth elements such as cerium, uh, neodymium, dysprosium, lanthanum are used in very strategic industries, very uh, green industries. A lot of them are used in electric vehicle batteries. Uh, you probably have heard of permanent magnets and NIB batteries, neodymium, iron and boron uh, magnets. A lot of these are used in wind turbines, solar power. Every, if you have a cell phone, I'm sure everyone does. Uh, there's magnets in this, you need neodymium for that. So all of our current new economy is being fueled, literally, with these strategic minerals. Uh, a lot of them, the rare earths. And uh, another analogy with oil, if you go back to the 1960s, 1970s, uh, the oil industry was basically monopolized by a cartel uh, led by Saudi Arabia. Uh, this industry is basically dominated by a monopoly of China. Uh, you'll see that there's you know, resources in Vietnam and Brazil, but they don't really produce anything. Uh, most of the Western economies, Great Britain, the United States, Western Europe, need these rare earth elements for their economies, for wind turbines, for magnets, for electronics, and so forth. And in many cases, the only supplier worldwide is China. And being reliant on one party is not a healthy business strategy. And especially when that country is not necessarily aligned with your interests, poses another problem. So what we hope to do is to address that situation with the properties that we have in uh, Latin America, in Brazil, and in Colombia. So we own or control directly or indirectly some very interesting properties in uh, the ones we're going to talk about are primarily in Colombia and in Brazil. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, we started a commodities trading business uh, with uh, two of our partners who are here from uh, Switzerland and Germany to source and to sell niobium and tantalum. And they're both used in, in electronics as well and also steel making. Uh, we had identified a property in Colombia that showed significant grades of tantalum and niobium. We asked them to send a sample to our lab in Montreal. They did. And what we found is that there were very super high concentrations, grades of these rare earth elements, the ones I mentioned. And as a result, we uh, optioned that property, we bought that property, and uh, we hope to bring that to production. We've been to Colombia a few times. I'm, I'm joined with our geologist, Joel Skudnik, who will talk a bit more about the technical side of things in a few minutes. But that led us on a journey to figure out what is the real value proposition in the rare earth space. And right now, there's a huge need for this. Uh, Mike Pompeo, the ex-Secretary of State in the United States, uh, identified this as the single biggest threat to US national security, was the reliance on China for these strategic minerals. A lot of them are used in aircraft, telecommunications, weaponry, and so forth, key industries that are very sensitive to the US government. Uh, also, one thing we'll also talk about, too, is that uh, it's one thing to have a resource, it's another thing to monetize it and make it commercially viable. Uh, the property in Brazil we'll talk about in a few moments, it uh, reached a stumbling block in that there were high concentrations of an element called thorium. And together with uranium, thorium is a radioactive element. And if you cannot extract it from the ore, the ore is essentially worthless. So let's talk a bit about the Colombian property first. So this is in the state of Pichada, the eastern part of uh, Colombia. It borders Venezuela. And uh, again, in the concentrates that we were sent, we were getting 60% uh, rare earth elements, total rare earth elements, which is a very, very high percentage. And that, if we can, uh, if we have those elements, and if there's no thorium issues, which we will address uh, in this uh, conversation today, that can be exported and we can uh, monetize that. So uh, we have an operation in Colombia. We own the land, we own the surface rights in that area. We have a team of 20 people that work on that property. We've, uh, we have about 30 little pits that we've uh, uh, looked at and analyzed ore. We have stockpile it. Where we are right now, we're waiting for permits from the uh, National Mining Agency in Colombia. Uh, we've submitted a voluminous amount of documentation. 
uh, to that National Mining Agency. There's been some back and forth. They've asked additional questions. And we hope to get those permits very shortly, at which time we'll be able to have equipment on site and to begin small-scale production of these uh, rare earth elements. And we've identified buyers and people have shown great interest in that. But in order to solidify those agreements, we need to have uh, the permits from the Colombian government. And again, we're expecting that very shortly. So I'll hand uh, the mic over to uh, Joel, who'll talk a bit more about the technical aspects of, uh, of the property in Bichada, Colombia. So just to put everything into perspective, the, the grades that we're getting in the concentrates of the rare earths, not just rare earths, but rare earths, coal tan minerals, niobium, tantalum, as well as platinum, uh, palladium, gold, uh, tin, titanium. It's, it's a whole melange of minerals that we're getting in both uh, Colombia and Brazil. So to put it into perspective, if it was a gold deposit, it would be roughly between 10 to 20 times greater in value than, than a rich, a very rich gold deposit. So the, the metal value that we're getting actually from these concentrates is around between 18 and $20,000 US per ton. So which would be roughly about 10 ounces of gold uh, per ton of material, which is extremely, extremely high grade. So just to give you an idea, so these are satellite images that were done in Vachada. And actually, the, uh, the property that we're doing the economic model on right now is the Minastique property, just to the north. It's 189 hectares. The property to the south is the Minastique South, or Agualinda. That's about 1,300 hectares. That was just acquired. And 10 kilometers south, southwest of this property, is another joint venture that Oxico has with the indigenous community of Guacamaya. So that, that's 20,000 hectare pro, uh, property. And they all have the same type of signature. Uh, so these nice colored maps, this is all done with satellite uh, imagery. And with this imagery, we were able to identify about 40 to 50 targets. So initially, we had a geologist go down there and verify on the ground a couple of these uh, target areas. And that's when he initially took some samples and got between 50 and 59% total rare earth oxides in the ground. My work is to verify all the previous work and to supervise all the programs of Oxigo. So I've already been down several times to Menestique and Guacamayas and have returned concentrates in the order of anywhere between 60 and 68%. And, and one, of the, one of the risks is, are actually that we've mitigated is the fact that we're going to be mining alluvial deposits. The benefit of mining alluvial deposits is that you don't have to, you're not, you're not drill, doing any drill blasting. Everything's already been concentrated by Mother, by mother Earth. So these, all these uh, anomalies here, these are all target areas, they actually represent these alluvial fans. They're, they're, they're ancient river systems called paleo channels. So we believe that these paleo channels go from Minastique property into Minastique South and possibly much further to the south as well. And this orange area going, going all the way around, it's kind of like a U-shaped. That is actually what we believe to be the bulk of the fan which, which contains a lot of the concentrates. So given the estimate of material, we believe we can have an operation that's going to last many, many years on, on the property. Did you want to talk yep, about, I'll this talk about this Okay. Okay, and uh, just one point to add on the concentrates. Uh, uh, we're able to get those concentrates just manually. Uh, there's no capex involved. It's basically they're panning uh, the ore and they're concentrating to that level. So it's a very simple operation, a very cheap and cost-effective operation. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we also have some contacts in Brazil in the state of uh, Rondonia. And uh, same thing, we looked at uh, an operation there. It's uh, some old tin tailings. So in this part of Brazil, they've been mining tin for the last 80 to 100 years. And what they've done, they've just simply amassed the tailings or the, uh, the residue from the, from the tin production and just stockpiled it. Uh, this is an enormous uh, stockpile. It's about 30 million tons. And these numbers come from a, stu a joint study that was done by DIRA, which is the uh, German Mineral Resources Agency, 
in conjunction with the Brazilian Geological Survey. So they looked at how they could monetize these tailings uh, from an economic perspective, and also it's an environmental liability just sitting there. Uh, so they, they could get concentrates of niobium, of, uh, of tin, and also of rare earths, but the issue they had was that, as I indicated previously, is that the thorium content was so high, it was running at about 6%. And this has to be below 0.25% in order for it to travel. Otherwise, it's too radioactive, it's too dangerous, no one will take it. So uh, we've formed a, a joint venture with uh, the owner of this property, and uh, we're able to get uh, very high concentrations of rare earths, and uh, we're able to extract uh, the uh, thorium. We have a technology that we've worked on over the last five years called ultrasound. Uh, in combination with various acids. And uh, the simple analogy is if you have a kidney stone, which I, I hope you never do, but if you do, it's the same principle. They will use ultrasound to pulverize the stone so you pass it naturally. It breaks it up into smaller parts. So we've used that same technology in, in mineral processing. Uh, we use ultrasound to bombard the ore. It breaks it up into its constituent parts, and we're able to extract the rare earths, able to extract the thorium. And we're getting very high recoveries, 80% plus recoveries by doing that. Uh, and this is at uh, atmospheric pressure, atmospheric temperature. Uh, it's very energy efficient, very green. And it's going to solve an environmental liability in Brazil uh, that can be monetized by our company and our shareholders and also for the Brazilian state. So it, again, it's one thing to have a process, or to have a deposit, uh, as they did in, in Brazil with these tailings. It's quite another to be able to process it and to extract uh, any nasty elements like thorium and bring that to production. So that's also part of the, the key value proposition of Oxico is that technology which uh, uh, enables us to do that. So I'll hand the, the mic back over to Joel to talk a bit more about uh, some of the other things we've been doing in uh, Latin America. One of the projects Oxico just acquired is called the Luz Angelica in Bolivia. And what we were looking for there is lithium and we actually had some really nice surprises because we got samples back from this property uh, that gave us over $200,000 uh, a ton which contained uh, one and a half kilos of lithium per ton so this is the green mica and when I saw that in the field usually when you get a green mica it infers it's called lipidolite and it infers that you ha have lithium concentrates in there but we got some really good surprises got a hundred grams of cesium per ton and 2.7 kilos per ton of rubidium, which is extremely high grade. So it's all locked up in these uh, lipid lipidolite crystals. And actually, in the, in the pit itself, I'll just go back here, um, it's very difficult to see, but the veins uh, are between two to three meters wide, and they're all over the pit. So uh, that pit was actually initially developed for another mineral. It was, it was for an industrial mineral. But we went beyond that, sampled it, and got some, some very high-grade uh, veins. And actually, these are, these are pegmatite veins. And we now know that the pegmatite veins are the source of this rubidium, lithium, and cesium. This is another one of the things that we found. Cesium is actually a yellow uh, crystal, a yellow mineral. So we started getting these uh, samples of quartz, just 100% sil silica, but always yellow stained or sometimes a little grayish and they were much heavier. They're carrying uh, some of these elements. So that's carrying actually one kilo per ton of cesium, but it's locked in with the quartz as well. And these quartz veins form like stock works, so they, they're all over the pit. So our next program actually will be to, this is, this is the property, will be to do a detailed exploration, run some geophysics over it, and to try to determine exactly where these, uh, these veins are, are located and access is excellent so we intend to go in there with an excavator open up these pits and put a pilot plant on there and start concentrating these minerals at the same time applying for permits and environmental license so this will take a little bit longer to get started in Colombia because Colombia were very advanced already as Mark was saying we've already got the it's called a PTO in Colombia it's a full uh, impact study and a full work program. So that's all been submitted to the National Mining Agency and as well as the Environmental Authority. So uh, I actually sat, sat in two round table discussions with the agency and we've got full support of the government. So I think those permits are gonna be issued very shortly. 
And once they are issued, within three months, we'll have a small plant built and another three months. So three to six months, we'll, we should have that into, into small scale operation in Colombia. In, in Brazil, uh, it's fully permitted. So we can actually go in there. I'm going to be sending the crew in there shortly. We'll be doing some bulk sample testing, some metallurgy. And right after that, we'll be ready to, to start the processing in, uh, in Brazil. It's a very extensive area. So um, within the next six months, there should be two operations starting for Oxigo. And uh, thanks, Joel. And just to add on, on Brazil, I mean, as I indicated, they're tailings. So there's no mining involved. It's just a pile of, of tailings of residue that we can monetize. As Joel said, it's fully permanent. Uh, we're in the final stages of our due diligence, uh, metallurgical analyses, and finalizing our joint venture agreement. And after that, we hope to bring that into small-scale production. Uh, so we have a, a two-stage two business plan. The first stage is to produce rare earth concentrates from both uh, Brazil and Colombia that uh, we've identified, uh, as I said, buyers uh, for these uh, concentrates. The real value uh, for the company will be if we can produce rare earth oxides, the 99.9% cesium, lanthanum, neodymium, uh, we were in Colombia just before Christmas of last year, and uh, we've, we've secured a location in a free trade zone in Santa Marta, which is the northern part of Colombia. And uh, essentially what we'll do is build a uh, facility there that will enable us to use our ultrasound technology and to produce uh, uh, those rare earth oxides. And the, the, feeds, the, the feeds for that facility will come from Colombia, come from Brazil, Bolivia, and they'll be processed there. So that's going to require additional capital, uh, 120 million-ish. Um, so if we can cash flow the company, demonstrate that we can sell these rare earth oxide uh, concentrates, then that's a, a key part of our, the value proposition of the company. And then we will look at doing uh, stage two, which is producing the uh, nearly pure, 99% uh, pure uh, rare earth oxides. Uh, just a bit on us. Uh, I'm a recovering investment banker. I'm not a geologist. I leave all of the, the hard work to Joel. Uh, but I've financed a number of uh, resource companies in the past. We have a pretty diversified uh, board. Uh, we have people based in, in Canada, also in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, here in the UK. Uh, we have a good combination of people who know the investment community as well as uh, technical experts. And just a bit on our share structure. Uh, we're listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange in Canada. Uh, symbol is AUAG. We have about 68 million shares outstanding at present, and uh, we're in a very good cash position. Since the beginning of this year, we've raised about $6 million and are looking to close another uh, small round of financing, which will enable us to uh, complete the work in Colombia and in Brazil and get into that small scale production. Uh, again, if, if things go well, we'll look to do a, a, another raise at a, at a different time uh, and hopefully at a different valuation to secure the funding for the uh, larger uh, facility in Santa Marta. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, Oxico and, and our value proposition. Uh, excited to be here, it's an exciting time. Um, you know, uh, we all know what's going on in the world with Ukraine and COVID. All this has had a, an, a very serious impact on our business and the fluctuation of metal prices, the fear of being uh, held captive by China is all playing, uh, is all positive factors. And, um, no, unfortunately for, the, for what's going on in Ukraine and so on, but it's, uh, this is a good place to be right now, rare earth elements. Uh, the market conditions uh, are very, very good. Uh, we can raise capital and we hope to bring these two projects to, uh, to fruition to generate cash flow and, and go from there. I'll stop. If there's any questions, uh, myself and or Joel can take them. So we've got time for one question at least. We'll take one question if, if we can. Do you have any plans for listing in London? Or? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we arrived here a couple of days ago and uh, we looked at that. So something we're seriously considering. Again, in conjunction with a larger uh, raise, uh, about a third of our shares are held by people here in the UK. Uh, we have a very good investor base. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, Jim is one of our shareholders. He's been with us from the very beginning. And I think uh, the plans are to seriously look at that. Yes, we've had conversations uh, with a couple of brokers, and uh, if there's an appetite for 
this kind of value proposition, by all means, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Thank you. Very good. Well, that sounds, uh, that sounds very encouraging. You say you're in a good place at a good time, for, for you at least, not, not for the rest of the world at the moment. So um, can we please have a round of appreciation, please, for our speakers? Thank you very much. Thank Mark you. Billings and Joel. And you're still here for a couple of hours or an hour, half yep. an hour? We're here at booth number 19. Please come see us if you have any questions.